Welcome to the fifth video in this series of critical appraisal modules. In this module, we will be focusing on the critical appraisal of case control studies using the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme, or CASP, approach. In the previous module, we spoke to you about cohort studies and their importance as the strongest design of the observational research studies. They are, however, only an appropriate design when the outcome of interest is relatively common. If we are studying a comparatively rare outcome, such as suicide, then we would need a vast number of participants in the cohort study, and to follow up these people over time for enough events, in this case suicide, to occur, to provide data which we could use to assess the association between exposure and outcome. Therefore, if we are studying a rare outcome, then a case control study is a more appropriate research design. For the learning outcomes for this module, first we will introduce you to the main features of the design of a case control study and discuss their benefits and value in healthcare. We will also introduce the measure of effect used to quantify findings in a case control study namely the odds ratio, and discuss how to calculate and interpret an odds ratio. Again, we want to get you thinking about those critical appraisal concepts relating to validity, trustworthiness of results, and value and relevance in the context of case control studies and how they might be applied in practice using an open access example of a case control study. Finally, there will be a link to a short quiz at the end of this video, which will give you the opportunity to test your knowledge on concepts we will have discussed. A case control study is retrospective. Instead of identifying people who have and have not been exposed to a factor of interest, as in a cohort study, we identify a group of cases, i.e. people who have the outcome of interest, and a group of controls, i.e. people who do not have the outcome of interest. We then study whether or not they have been exposed to a factor of interest with a view to investigating whether the exposure may be causing the outcome. In case control studies, the odds ratio is a common measure of effect in quantifying the association between an exposure and a disease. So let's look at this. Calculating an odds ratio is quite similar to calculating the risk ratio that we looked at in the cohort studies module. We'll use the same fictional data that we used then with fictional data about the relationship between smoking and lung cancer as an example. We can calculate the odds ratio by first calculating the odds of being a smoker in the group with lung cancer then by calculating the odds of being a smoker in the group without lung cancer, and then by dividing the two odds. To calculate the odds of being a smoker in the lung cancer group, it's A divided by B, which gives 5.66. To calculate the odds of being a smoker in those without lung cancer, it's C divided by D, which gives 0.053. To express the odds of being a smoker in the group with the outcome to the group without the outcome, it's 5.66 divided by 0.053, which gives 106.8. This means, in this fictional example, that people with lung cancer are 106.8 times more likely to be smokers than those without lung cancer. If this were a real finding, it would be a very large odds ratio. Case control studies are a useful design for investigating the possible effects of rare exposures, and they are usually relatively quick and inexpensive to undertake. However, like all research studies in healthcare, their quality can vary so it is important to critically appraise their quality. The CASP programme 
has produced a checklist for critically appraising case control studies, the link to which is located below this video. We can see that the CASP Cohort Studies Checklist again separates the three key principles of critical appraisal of validity, trustworthiness of results and value and relevance into three sections, A, B and C respectively. Let's see how these can be addressed with an example. We'll have a look at this checklist and apply its use to a sample case control study by Drucker et al. 2018 on eczema and subsequent suicide, a matched case control study, the link to which is also below this video. The first question in the checklist is to consider whether the case control study examined a clearly focused question. The answer for this study would appear to be yes, as the authors considered the association between eczema and a patient's subsequent risk of death from suicide. They contextualised this research question against the observation that eczema is associated with reduced quality of life in common with many chronic conditions, and that previous research has linked eczema with psychiatric illness. This question concerns whether or not a case control study was an appropriate design to answer the research question. For example, we might consider a cohort study, as this is a generally stronger design, or an experimental study. In this case, a case control study does seem to be appropriate, as an experimental study is not feasible because it isn't possible to randomly allocate people to have eczema, and because the outcome of suicide is relatively rare, so a cohort study is not suitable. The CASP checklist suggests a number of useful points to consider regarding the selection of cases into the study. This is an important issue, as the selection of appropriate cases and controls is key to the validity of a case control study. To say a bit about the selection of cases, Cases should be people with the outcome of interest, but the cases should be selected irrespective of their exposure status. In this case, it would not be appropriate for cases, i.e. those who had died by suicide, to be chosen because they had eczema. It is also important that cases are classified according to a reliable and or standardised means of classification such as by using the ICD classification system or by using public registers or coroner's reports. In this study, cases were identified using coroner's reports, which appears to be a reliable means of classification. The selection of controls is fundamental to the design of a good case control study. If controls are not selected appropriately, then this could introduce selection bias into the case control study. The key point is that controls should be representative of the population from which the cases are drawn, so that the controls could have been cases if they had developed the outcome of interest. Like the selection of cases, it is important that controls are selected irrespective of their exposure status. In this study, it would not be appropriate for controls to be selected because they did not suffer from eczema. Population controls can be selected in a number of ways, for example by using electoral rolls or lists of patients in GP practices. Sometimes, however, instead of using population controls, case control studies select controls from within hospital patients. This is usually quicker than finding population controls, but it introduces bias in the study because hospital patients may not be representative of the general population, as they are likely to be less healthy than the general public. In this study, the researchers selected controls from a general population sample 
using the registered persons database that identifies all patients insured under the Ontario Health Insurance Plan, a universal system of health coverage. Matching is another important point. Matching is a way to account for the possible effects of confounding in a case control study. Age, sex and socioeconomic status are common confounders and we can account for their effects by matching cases and controls on factors such as these. So if we have a case age 35, we can match them with a control of the same or a similar age. In this study, cases were matched with controls on age, sex and socioeconomic status, which strengthens the robustness of this study's design. As we saw when we looked at cohort studies, it is important that exposures are accurately measured to minimise bias. This is particularly a problem in studies where exposures have been classified according to self-report, as this is affected by the fallibility of memory and also knowledge of what is being studied may make people over or underestimate the extent to which they have been exposed. This study used a system of classification using health records rather than self-report. But this can still be problematic and the authors discussed the difficulties they had in classifying and identifying instances of persistent eczema in the discussion section and they acknowledged that they may have misclassified persistent eczema. It is important that aside from the outcome the cases and controls are similar in important respects. Confounding factors are a key consideration here and as we said earlier it strengthens this study's research design that the authors have attempted to account for the effects of confounding by matching cases and controls on factors which could be confounders. They also undertook statistical analyses to stratify cases and controls by other relevant suicide risk factors, such as depression, to see if the association between eczema and suicide could be explained by these other risk factors. In fact, it could, as the association was not independent of overall mental health. What are the results? How precise was the estimate of effect? And do you believe the results? The odds ratio is used to quantify the strength of the association between exposure and outcome in a case control study. The odds ratio is the ratio of the odds of being exposed in the group with the outcome to the odds of being exposed in the group without the outcome. If the odds ratio is greater than 1, it means that the outcome group are more likely to be exposed. The higher the number, the greater the odds. If the odds ratio is less than 1, it means that the outcome group are less likely to be exposed. The lower the number, the less likely they are to be exposed. It is also possible to calculate confidence intervals around an odds ratio. In the cohort studies module, we looked at how confidence intervals are the range within which the true value lies, and that if a 95% confidence interval has a certain range, then we can be 95% confident that this represents the true odds ratio in the population. The narrower the confidence interval, the more informative it is. In this study, the odds of the association between persistent eczema and suicide was 1.22, with a 95% confidence interval of 1.01 to 1.48. This odds ratio represents only a small increase in risk and the 95% confidence interval almost includes the value of no effect, i.e. 1. Questions 9, 10 and 11 on the CASP checklist relate to the believability of results. The believability of results can be assessed by considering the factors we have previously discussed, such as confounding or bias.
it's also important to consider whether the results may have been affected by chance. Assessing the believability of results requires judgment and consideration of factors such as the biological plausibility of the relationship between exposure and outcome and the contextualization of the case control study in the wider body of research in the field. The sixth module in this series will look at cross-sectional studies and we will be following a similar format that we used in this video to appraise an example of a recent study. Thank you for listening. These training videos have been developed by the Cochrane Common Mental Disorders Group at the University of York with support from T's Esk and Weir Valleys NHS Foundation Trust, Northumberland Tyne and Weir NHS Foundation Trust and the Economic and Social Research Council. If you would like to test your knowledge on the topics introduced in this module, please follow the link below which will take you to a short online quiz.